It's nice to be here talking with you. I wish I could be there in person with you. Um, Thank you for that kind introduction. As a headache specialist, I'm happy and pleased to share with you my knowledge about how to take care of headache patients. Um, I know headache is not necessarily your, ex your area of expertise, but being in the neurology unit and seeing so many patients with neurological disorders, I'm sure you come across many patients with headaches. Um, I would like to, let me minimize that. There we go. Um, this. In this talk, I'm gonna first talk about how we categorize headaches. Then I'm going to focus in on primary headaches and looking at worrisome or red flag causes of secondary headaches. We're going to talk about how do you approach a first encounter and taking a history and what are our goals for the encounter? We're gonna do a case together and talk about migraine preventative therapies, acute treatments, as well as status migranosis, and then wrap up. So headache is, um, it's a symptom. It's not a diagnosis in the same way that stomach ache is not a diagnosis. There are over uh, 150 different headache diagnoses and they're all classified by features, um, what headaches are caused by and so forth. And this is all developed by the International Classification of Headache Disorders developed by the International Headache Society over the decades. And we categorize them into three main types of headaches. One is primary headache disorders, and those are headaches from things like migraine or tension type headache or cluster headache, and there are many other headache disorders in the primary headache group. They're not caused by another process, whereas secondary headaches are things like trauma, tumor, uh, meningitis, aneurysms, something metabolic that could cause a headache where there's an underlying cause and then the headache goes away once that underlying cause is fixed. And then the last classification of headaches are called cranial neuropathy. You, I'm sure you've all heard of trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, and there's also facial pain that's also related to different types of neuropathies. Today, we're going to focus on the, the most common primary headache disorders, uh, migraine, tension headache, and cluster headache. And then we're going to talk a bit about secondary disorders um, and how to look for those as well. So tension type headaches, actually the most common headache disorder affecting over 70% of the population, you are less likely to see this in clinical practice. Many secondary headaches mimic tension type headaches. So if a patient's coming to you and saying that they have tension type headache, they are probably having something else, whether it be migraine or another secondary headache, and I'll explain why in a moment. And migraine actually affects a lot of people, over about six, 15 to 16% of the population. You'll see that the things that people worry about the most are the least common, but certainly nothing that one would want to miss. So as I mentioned, primary headache disorders are extremely common. Migraine affects 15% of the population. 20% of women experience it where it's about 6% in the male population. If you think about how common this is, it's more common than diabetes, asthma, and epilepsy combined. And it's considered the second most disabling condition globally in years lost to disability. Um, and it's first amongst women under 50. And this is according to the World Health Organization's classification for disease disability. About 5% of the population has chronic migraine and chronic migraine is the term that we reserve for people who are having 15 headache days per month or more of which at least eight days are migraine. We talked about tension type headache. Again, it's less common seen in clinical practice. And cluster headache is something that we teach and think about because it's one of the most painful of all headache disorders and it affects about one per thousand people. Slight male predominance, but um, it's now at a ratio of about one to two. So uh, two men for every one woman, it used to be considered uh, a bigger discrepancy, but I think more women are now getting the correct diagnosis. So let's look at how you make these diagnoses. Well, it's based on pain characteristics, 
associated features, duration, and ensuring that a secondary cause is not present. And I have these two next to each other because if you look at them, you'll see that they're opposites. Migraine typically has to have at least two of these features, one-sided, moderate to severe, throbbing, worse with activity. Compare that with tension type headache, which has to have two characteristics of which they are bilateral, mild to moderate, non-throbbing, and not worse with activity. Migraines are associated with light and sound sensitivity or nausea or vomiting, whereas tension headache may just have some little bit of light or sound sensitivity, but never both, and never vomiting or nausea. The attack duration may be similar. Migraine typically lasts four to 72 hours. We think of it as a recurrent disorder, being back to your baseline in between attacks. And um, tension type headache can last anywhere from 30 minutes to seven days. Usually 30 minutes to a day is a common um, <clears throat> frequency. Migraine itself, in order to make the diagnosis, a person has to have had at least five episodes. And for tension headaches, it's at least 10 episodes. And the reason that that's included in the criteria is again, because we want to make sure that we're distinguishing it from a secondary headache disorder. A first presentation with migraine um, where secondary causes are ruled out is considered probable migraine, and you watch it to make sure that that patient continues to do well and follow them to make sure that they don't have any secondary causes. Now, some people don't think of themselves as having migraine unless they have an aura, and I have many patients with migraine aura who, say, who talk about their migraine auras, and then they say, well, I get regular headaches, but the regular headaches are migraine. So if we think about migraine aura, people, uh, about 30% of people with migraine have aura and many people with aura also have migraine without aura. Aura is the term that we use for reversible neurological symptoms that unlike stroke, which are maximal at onset, these are gradual and onset and generally peaking at about five minutes and they last anywhere from five to 60 minutes and then go away again. They can include visual, sort of this zigzag line feature or um, a scotoma. It can be the second most common is sensory where people get tingling in their fingers and then they can get this march, like almost like epilepsy, like symptom of numbness going up to half of their face. Interestingly, it usually includes the full tongue. Um, less common are speech disturbances where people have um, are unable to speak properly or they have an expressive aphasia or a receptive aphasia. And some people have hemiplegic migraine with motor impairments. There are some other um, auras that are rare. There's one called Alice in Wonderland syndrome. I included this picture. Some patients describe these symptoms that are reminiscent of what Alice in Wonderland felt in that book by um, Lewis Carroll, where she felt gets really, really tall and really, really small. It's understood that Lewis Carroll as an author had this syndrome, which was a migraine aura, and that's how he included it in his novel. I wanted to share with you, for those of you who've never had migraine or migraine aura, this is what it looks like. And I often, if patients are having a hard time describing it to me, I'll often pick images from the internet to show them, to have them see or attest to what they're seeing. This video shows um, a reenactment of what it's like to have a visual aura. People get this central scotoma that can either be bright or gray, and it's hard to see through it. And then it gradually expands in the visual field and people can see these zigzag lines or colorful, sometimes they're black and white, and those are called fortification spectra. It gradually envelops the visual field. It's seen in both eyes. It's never unilateral, like you might see with a retinal stroke. And then it ultimately fades away. And then a headache may follow this, or some people may not get a migraine or might not get a headache afterwards. 
I want to switch now to the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias after going through the diagnostic criteria of migraine and tension type headache. This is our third most commonly seen headache disorder in clinical practice. The trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias are a group of headache disorders that, unlike cluster headache, are short duration. That's the key piece of this. They're short duration, recurrent episodes with autonomic symptoms on the same side of the headache. So what are autonomic symptoms? The autonomic nervous system also includes nerves within the brain and the head. And when these get activated, people can get a red or teary eye or a droopy eyelid. They can get nasal congestion or rhinorrhea, even swelling around the eye. Um, they can get a ptosis or forehead or facial swelling. It's usually ipsilateral to the side of the pain and comes with the headache and then resolves once the headache is over. The pathophysiology of these trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias or TACs as they're known are not well understood. We know that they involve the trigeminal autonomic reflex and they also involve the posterior hypothalamic gray. You might hear soon about orexin because I see that there are orexin products coming out for sleep. Orexin is very involved in the um, pathophysiology of cluster headache. And then there are neuropeptides involved, just as in with migraine, CGRP, um, and these other uh, neuropeptides. So how do we make the diagnosis of cluster headache? Well, like the other headache disorders, a person has to have had at least five attacks and meet these criteria. They have to be severe or very severe, unilateral. It's typically around the eye or in the temporal area, although less commonly it's seen in the cheek and the jaw and in the temple in the back of the head. These are short duration headaches that last 15 to 180 minutes and are considered the most debilitating pain that a person can have. And that has to have the autonomic symptom, at least one of those that we talked about. Unlike people with migraine or even tension headache who prefer to not do much or maybe rest a little bit with migraine, cluster headaches and the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias are associated with a sense of restlessness. Uh, if you see patients with this, they may pace. Some of them may actually hit their head or hit their head against walls because the pain is so severe. Now the attack frequency is typically every other day up to eight times a day. And it's called cluster headache because it occurs in clusters lasting anywhere from weeks to months at a certain time of the year. And then it's followed by a remission anywhere from months to year. Interestingly, there seems to be um, a circadian rhythm involved in this, typically waking people up from sleep an hour and a half into sleep, although it can occur at other times a day. And there's also a diurnal um, and um, annual uh, preference for people exhibiting clusters. They tend to happen at the longest and shortest time, days of the year, so often around the springtime or in the winter are common times for people to experience this. Again, these are um, not better accounted for by another diagnosis. So it's not caused by a brain tumor or other underlying pathology apart from the cluster headache itself. There is a chronic form. I have a couple of patients who have chronic cluster headache and that's when they either have no remission. So the attacks are every day or their remission, their remission is um, three months or less per year. Obviously, these patients need to be on preventative therapy because the risk of self-harm can be high with untreated pain. This is a busy slide, and I really just wanted to bring it up because I want you to know that there are a few other trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias or TACs, and they really are divided by duration. So we have cluster headache. We talked about its diagnosis, and these are longer duration headaches in terms of within this short duration group, lasting anywhere from 15 minutes to 180 minutes. 
The next shortest is paroxysmal hemicrania, also severe unilateral headache occurring multiple times a day, but shorter duration, lasting two to 30 minutes. And then these last two over here, Sunct and Suna, are really, really brief. They're extremely rare disorders. People go get these quick, repetitive stabbing pains that occur on the side of their pain, and they get those same autonomic systems of symptoms of drooping. They'll often hold their head and will get profuse tearing, and it occurs every day with multiple attacks a day. Sunk and Suna sand for short-lasting unilateral neuralgia form headache with conjunctival tearing and injection. And Suna is the short lasting unilateral form headache with um, autonomic features. You will see here that there is an inverse relationship to duration and time. So put simply, the longer the name, the shorter the duration. So the question might be, well, what do names, why do names make a difference? Well, the diagnosis always leads to the treatment, just like in any other condition. Cluster headache, the way it's treated is with, typically when a cluster attack occurs, it's treated with a steroid lasting over anywhere from eight to 14 days, a tapering course of steroid along with the prevention, like either valproic acid, verapamil is the most common one we use, but you have to look at drug interactions. And lithium also has very good efficacy. Patients who are triptan candidates also can use triptans, like sumatriptan can be very helpful by either nasal spray or injectable. And very importantly, inhaled oxygen is really helpful. It's got an efficacy at least as good of, if not greater than the triptans. Now, paroxysmal hemicrania continua, or hemicrania is a different disorder, even though it's shorter duration, it doesn't respond to any of the treatments that cluster headache responds to. It's uniquely responsive to indomethacin within, with even within low doses dosed throughout the day. Now, sunct and suna, we don't really have a good treatment for it, but we believe that lamictal or lamotrigine can be helpful. This headache disorder on the far light, right, I just want to include that in here just to let you know that this exists. Hemicrania continua is a strictly one-sided headache, but it's constant. It's a 24-7, never goes away, unilateral headache that can look like migraine, but it always has these autonomic symptoms. And it's clear, it's, its key component also is that there's zero headache-free time. It's an important um, headache disorder to think about in patients who you think have migraine but aren't getting better because it is uniquely responsive to indomethacin and will give patients complete headache freedom while taking that medication. I'm going to switch gears to say, well, okay, so we have these headache diagnoses. We've talked about migraine, tension type headache, cluster headache. Um, we've talked about the trigeminal autonomic cephalologist. How do you figure out? You have a patient, what's what? You have a patient in front of you. I like to think about duration and think about dividing everything into short duration headaches lasting less than four hours. And that will include the recurrent trigeminal autonomic salphalalgias. It may include tension type headache, but they won't have any of those autonomic symptoms. And there are some other primary headache disorders that we won't get a chance to talk about today. But think about the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias for the short duration headaches. For longer duration headaches, four or more hours, that's when we'll think about migraine, hemicrania continua, even tension type headache, and another headache called new daily persistent headache, which is also daily from onset, but can look like migraine or tension type headache. Now, migraine itself can come in a chronic form, as I mentioned, more than 15 days per month, and episodic is considered less than 15 days per month. Tension type headache also has an episodic and chronic form. New daily persistent headache, as I said, is daily from onset. And hemicrania continua is a 24-7 one-sided headache. So you've spoken with your patient. You think, well, I think this is a primary headache disorder. It's a, let's say it's a new onset headache. They haven't had headaches before, but let's ask them other questions to make sure that nothing else is going on. The mnemonic SNOOP 
has been developed by Dr. Dave Dodick, who is a neurologist and headache specialist. And it's a good mnemonic because it, if you think about this system, systematically, you can go through in your mind looking for red flags for secondary headaches. Systemic signs or symptoms are what you'd see in any medical condition that you would be worried out is causing a headache, fever, rash, stiff neck, history of cancer, someone who's immunocompromised, trauma, all of these are red flags, new onset of a headache in a patient with a cancer history or a stiff neck. Neurological symptoms, if someone comes with progressive motor weakness or sudden onset right-sided weakness or blurred vision of sudden onset, you're gonna think about either a stroke or maybe a gradually enlarging tumor or a bleed into a tumor and so forth. Anyone who develops headaches for the first time over the age of 50 needs to be screened closely for secondary headaches. Most of the primary headache disorders typically begin in younger years. Um, other red flags would be in an older patient would be any jaw claudication, thinking about temporal arteritis. Onset of headache is also really important. Anyone presenting with a thunderclap headache, worst headache of life, is a clear red flag for either aneurysm or sinus thrombosis or intracranial hypotension um, or bleed. Also, a headache that is uh, worse with position, so something that's waking up people from people from sleep, or they're worse with bending over, or coughing, or straining. Thinking, about, think about an intracranial process or idiopathic uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Or there's also low pressure headaches. Let's say you've done a spinal tap on a patient, and now they have a terrible headache, but it's worth worth standing. Think about intracranial hypotension. Other things that should prompt a secondary workup is someone, we talked about new onset headache or if someone has a change in headache. So if their headaches are progressively worsening or they're no longer, you know, no longer responsive to medication or they're developing new symptoms, that should prompt a workup. New onset headache during pregnancy and postpartum should bring a close evaluation and physical exam. And any headache precipitated by fast salva, cough, sneeze, or bending over should be worked up for secondary causes. If you want to take a screenshot of this, if you have this later, I think this is a really nice table that can be used for you to think through SNOOPs when you're going through it, because it also has a differential diagnosis section. And this is also taken from Dave Dodick's paper in seminars in neurology. So now let's look at goals for headache. The goals for the headache for your first encounter for a headache is one, is this a primary or secondary headache disorder? You're gonna identify worrisome symptoms with SNOOPs, work it up accordingly. And if it's a primary headache disorder, you want to identify the diagnosis using the international criteria and educate the patient about the disorder and come up with a treatment plan setting up realistic goals and expectations. People who have frequent migraines where you're reducing frequency, that reduction can take a couple of months to start to see the improvement. So letting people know that helps them temper their expectations. And then also giving patients acute treatment plans, lifestyle approaches, and partnering with them on medications so that they get the best choices that give the least amount of side effects. You're all very proficient in taking histories, and I'm sure you do this with every type of disorder you have in terms of headaches, onset of symptoms. We talk about a new or old problem, sudden onset or gradual onset. What are the pain features are like, specifically location, quality, effect of activity on the headache, and also intensity. You also want to ask the frequency, duration, and timing of the headaches. And then, of course, the associated features that we talked about that are so typical in either migraine, cluster headache, or other headache disorders. Triggers are important. Patients are very eager to tell you about that and can provide insight to whether or not it may be neck related or some other trigger. 
And of course, treatments that they're using and always a thorough neurologic and general exam, including listening to carotid arteries. So I wanna take a little break now and turn from didactic and turn to um, questions. I can't see you, but maybe we can use chat if people are comfortable with using chat. My first case is Maya. She's a 25 year old Asian American woman. She has a history of irritable bowel syndrome, but that seems to be well under control. She presents with headaches since the age of 14. She describes the headaches as bilateral, pulsating. They get to be seven out of 10 and built gradually. She prefers to rest with them when they come on. She has light and sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting. She doesn't have any aura or any autonomic symptoms. And she's come to see you because she's getting progressively more headaches. They used to be twice a month, and now they're four times a month over the last year. They last about 36 hours untreated. Her exam is normal. Are there other questions that you would like to ask this patient? And can we go into maybe chat? And please feel free to uh, chat in here. Is there a way for folks to chat? Yeah, chat box is open. Great. I'm going to first ask you, and I'm going to have you just type in, and you can. And there's uh, obviously no grade on this, so I'd love to hear what you think. Do you think first of all, is this a primary or secondary headache? Uh, let's have three potential answers: primary, secondary, or not sure. No takers. No takers. Primary. Okay, we got one vote for primary. Primary. Okay, so we've got several votes for primary. Would any of those who are typing on chat, thank you. Can you tell me what her diagnosis is? And if you have any other questions, type them in as well. Okay, great answers. Okay, these are terrific answers, thank you. So we're down, the majority is primary. We've got one for migraine and one for tension headache. Let's look at her features. So these are um, bilateral. So that could be tension headache, right? Throbbing. These are throbbing, so that feels more into the migraine camp. Um, they're moderate to severe. They're more on the severe side. So we're gonna put that into the migraine camp. And she prefers to rest. So we're gonna put that into the migraine camp. So she has one tension type headache symptom in terms of the pain quality and three migraine type symptoms. So, so far, this is more likely to be migraine. Let's look at the associated features. She has light and sound sensitivity, which are migraine features, nausea and vomiting, which are migraine features. So this now puts this into the migraine camp. So we're gonna call this episodic migraine without aura. Now, some of you also may have wondered, well, it's increasing in frequency, is that a red flag? Well, maybe. However, she's normal in between attacks. The attacks feel the same. And so that's reassuring. So in a patient like this, you would wanna give her a good acute treatment and watch her over time. And if they get worse, and as long as her exam's normal, but if she gets worse, then maybe consider doing some studies on her. So thank you for responding to the chat. So now you've given her a medication. You, you haven't heard from her. She comes back in a year and she now has new symptoms. She's describing this visual changes and you pull up this picture and she says, yep, that's what it looks like. It started about four months ago. It's followed by a strong migraine, typical like she had migraines before. She's only had three episodes in the last month. Um, and the vision changes last about 20 minutes. It's seen in both eyes. And then she feels back to normal. She's getting them twice a week. 
she's, uh, which is actually a higher frequency than she had before. And uh, sorry, her migraine frequency is twice a week and she's treating with a triptan that doesn't work very well. So just to condense that, she's developed this thing that looks like visual aura. She's had three episodes in the last four months. And then her migraine frequency without aura has now increased to twice a week from once a week. So with this now, any takers for whether or not this is a primary or secondary headache? Does anybody have concerns here about this new onset? And do you have any questions about like, why is she getting it or anything like that? Any thoughts? And if not, that's okay too. Okay. Well, people can develop aura. Let's see what else she's saying. She's got another symptom. Let's go on to our next slide. So now she's developed something else. What do you all think that is? Is this stroke? Is this migraine aura? What are your thoughts? Tell me what you might consider when you see this patient and let's just break it down to how we approach something. Are we thinking, well, she has a primary headache disorder. Now, what is this? Is it primary or secondary? Is anyone confident or is anyone not sure about this? I'll tell you, if I saw this, I would not be sure about it. And I would want to ask her some more questions like, Anything trigger this? Did you go to the emergency room? And she said, well, it happened once or twice and then she was able to speak better, but that's why she made the appointment because she, this is scaring her. She reveals that she started taking an estrogen containing birth control pill five months ago. Any takers for what the next steps are and why? Rule out thrombosis. Yep, that certainly is. Look for VTE. Yes, exactly. Those are concerns. Any other takers? You're all go you're going in the absolute right direction. Is this a thrombus? Did she have a stroke? Is she having recurrent TIAs? And that's because the estrogen containing birth controls, obviously, whether you have migraine or not, is a stroke risk factor. So the first step, obviously, is to tell her to stop taking the estrogen and then the, the, while you're working her up for a stroke and doing a full workup for this patient. Um, patients who have migraine with aura have a higher stroke risk than patients with migraine without aura. Patients with migraine without aura have a baseline stroke risk relative to people without migraine. And that's about, and if you take someone who's a, a young woman under 50, their stroke risk is about two per 10,000 over a five-year period. If you look at someone with migraine with aura, that stroke increases to four per 10,000 over a five-year period. So not a lot, but a lot of it happens to you. And then if you add in a birth control pill, then that stroke risk increases sevenfold. So still the relative rate is low, but the caveat here is if anyone who has migraine with aura or even doesn't and develops migraine or without aura and develops an aura on birth control, the birth control must be stopped for because of the risk of dramatic stroke. Um, this case is actually a case that was well publicized on television because she was a CNN reporter, I believe, covering the Grammys or the Oscars. She was taken to the ER. She had a full stroke workup that fortunately was all negative, And it was thought to be that her first development of a migraine with aura. And since then, she I understand she's doing well and being treated. But a patient like that should not be on any estrogen containing hormones. So let's move now to what do you treat? How do you treat people with migraine? Well, we use preventatives for people who are having frequent migraines and I'm just gonna go over the classes here. 
I know you all can read and I know you'll have access to these slides, but I break them up into level A, which is considered effective level B, probably effective. So we think about to pyramate, we don't use valproic acid as, uh, as often because of its side effect profile, especially in women of childbearing heirs, years. Beta blockers can be very effective. Candesartan, which is an ARB, has excellent data, as do our new CGRP monoclonal body once a month injection and infusions. And of course, there's Botox for people who are having more than 15 headache days per month. And the second level also are actually quite effective. Amitriptyline or even nortriptyline, venlafaxin has very good data, a couple of other beta blockers, and even lisinopril. There are newer oral CGRP receptor blockers. CGRP stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide. It's a molecule that is an inflammatory protein that's very elevated when people are having migraine attacks. So it's actually our first migraine-specific treatment. And they come in the injectable form for prevention for people having four or more moderate to severe headaches per month. And they come in oral forms, Remigipant, or its brand name is Nurtec, is used for prevention, taking it every other day. And it's also used acutely instead of a triptan. And there's another one on the market called a Tojapant that's also dosed daily for prevention. These medications can't be used or has to be used with caution in patients who are on C CYP3A4 inhibitors um, or inducers. They can change the uh, pharmacokinetics of it. Um, so how do you decide, when do you give someone migraine treatment? Well, this is uh, as simplified as it gets, but basically if a person's having five, four or six migraines a month, even if they're not having much disability, they may, they may need a preventative if they can't get a hold of the acute attack. And that's because the more headaches you get, the more likely you are going to get headaches. The goal of the prevention is to reduce the frequency by at least 50% make a person better for a year, and then ultimately retrain the brain and take them off the preventative so they're back to a lower frequency headache, um, migraine frequency. Um, if people are having really severe disabling migraines that are only happening two to three times a month, they may need a prevent preventative. And the goal is to reduce frequency, severity, duration, and disability, and importantly, improve people's quality of life, which means you have to think about the side effect profile of medications. How do you choose these medications? Well, if you have a person with high frequency migraine who has high blood pressure, choose a blood pressure agent. If they have anxiety or depression, choose one of those medications. If they are overweight, you might wanna to use topiramate because it has weight loss and obesity is a risk factor for chronic migraine. And then Botox is used only for people who have chronic migraine, that's 15 headache days per month for at least three months. And typically the recommendations are to try at least two to three migraine preventatives first because of its cost. The CGRP injectors are typically used for people who've also tried and failed a couple of medications because they're newer to the market. And we also use them for people who are having at least four migraine days per month. Bear with me one minute here. So acute treatments, I know you've all heard of triptans on this list. I just want you to know there's seven of them on the market. They work on these serotonin specific receptors, 5H2, 1B and 1D receptors. These can cause vasoconstriction. So they are not used in people who've had stroke, heart disease or uncontrolled vascular risk factors. They're not used for people who have prolonged aura or are lasting more than 60 minutes or migraine with brainstem or a complicated numbness, weakness, speech problems, hemiplegic migraine. Avoid it with those. Um, that's also true of the ergotamines, which we won't talk about. We just talked about the Japans and that's what we, I, oh, I'm so sorry, hold on, there we go. And that was the Remijapan, the Pro Japan, the CGRP blockers. I want you to know those are on the market and are excellent for people who have auras. They're not going to be contraindicated for most of those um, that the triptans are contraindicated for. There's a question about whether or not the CGRP blockers are 
um, an issue in coronary artery disease or coronary or, um, vascular, cerebrovascular disease, we're not quite sure. So lismitidan is another option because it has no vascular effect. It works like a triptan, but works on a different subreceptor. So it's safe to use in people who have cardiovascular disease, although it is quite sedating. Um, there are NSAIDs that where triptans don't work or contraindicated, and then antiemetics can be used too. I want to just segue into how do you treat? Well, you want to treat at the earliest sign of the pain. If it's mild to moderate, treat with one of the simpler things like ibuprofen or aspirin or Tylenol with caffeine, but do not use opioids. If it's moderate to severe or not responding to those first line treatments, then use the migraine specific treatments. Go with the triptans or the Japans or lismitidan, one of those three options. If anyone has nausea, make sure that that's addressed before the oral medication is, is taken. Otherwise the oral medication won't work very well or consider using a nasal spray. I always give my patients a uh, backup, either a muscle relaxant or an anti-inflammatory in case the primary acute treatment doesn't work. And I advise them to not use their acute treatments more than two days a week. Otherwise that puts them at risk of developing chronic migraine. Uh, I'm going to move past that into status migranosis. So status migranosis is something that you'll probably see in the wards. Um, this is for people who have a diagnosis of migraine and their migraine is not breaking after 72 hours. The pain is typically debilitating. You rule out secondary causes either by history, like, oh yeah, this has happened to me before. It feels like my typical migraine and exam is normal or testing. Sometimes these people need um, labs or they need um, brain imaging. We typically treat status migranosis using either a steroid, dexamethasone works very well, medrol dose packs or prednisone taper. When that's not helpful, we use dihydroergotamines as a nasal spray. Also something simple like naproxen, 500 milligrams twice a day for five days can be very helpful or even indomethacin over a five day period has been shown to be helpful. And if patients can't take any of those, taking a regimen of one of these anti-emetics anti or dopamine blockers like Benadryl can be really helpful in breaking a headache cycle. Hydration is also really important which takes us to inpatient treatment or emergency department. So let's say someone's on the floor and they're not feeling well, what can you give them? If any of this doesn't interact with what they're doing and you know it's a typical migraine, fluids can be really helpful. It's been shown that even just IV fluids, a two to three liter bolus can be really helpful. IV Benadryl, um, metoclopramide given with Benadryl, um, prochlorperazine, magnesium can be really helpful, ketorolac. These are our typical cocktails often given as toradol or ketorolac, reglan and Benadryl together as a cocktail. And if that doesn't work, then you can uh, call a neuroconsult or talk to like one of the neurology headache folks and talk to them about dosing for valproic acid acutely or IV methylprednisolone. And sometimes we give IV DHE in patients who have not used triptans within 24 hours and don't have contraindications. If you feel like you need to go down this IV DHE route, there are protocols certainly within, um, within Cornell, and I presume you have it over at MSK. If not, please let us know and we'll make sure you have that protocol for inpatient use of a patient if other um, approaches are not working for your patients. We talked about that. So just to summarize, um, headache disorders are common, they're disabling. Most headaches are primary disorders, but looking for secondary diagnoses with SNOOP is always part of an initial valuation. Approach each patient, develop a systematic manner so you're always thinking in a systematic approach. And once you have a primary diagnosis, partner with your patient for effective evidence-based treatments to reduce frequency, severity, duration, and disability. I can tell you as a headache specialist, headache is one of the most debilitating conditions globally, and it is one of the most rewarding things to treat. You can give a person their life back. 
please, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them in 